right. Hello, everybody. Uh, whether you are, well, you guys are in good mood tonight here at Legacy. I like it. Hopefully, everybody online is in a good mood, too, at home or wherever you are. Today, uh, we continue the series we're in, as we just heard the song, What You Want, What You Really, Really Want. And the series comes from a passage in, uh, in Jesus' life in the New Testament. We talked about it the first week of the series where Jesus looks at somebody, Bartimaeus, this blind guy, and says, what do you want me to do for you? And when God says, what do you want me to do for you? Well, that's, that's a big question. And Bartimaeus opens up his life. He says, hey, I want to see. But Jesus does a lot more than that, a whole lot more than that. And when you and I open up our life to him, we may start with that felt need. Here's what I want. He actually has way more once we open up our lives in that area. He, he, there's a whole lot more he wants to do in addition to that. And that's the spirit of this series. And we solicited some feedback from a bunch of people just saying, hey, if, you, uh, if Jesus looked at you and said, what do you want me to do for you, what would you say? And that's what has informed each week of this series. And so this week, what we're talking about is the top answer of, of, of all the people who said, hey, this is what I would want. And it also happens to be the most prominent thing that whenever we solicit prayer requests, which, by the way, we always, uh, there's a prayer team here. You can always email into the church or call into the church. And there's hundreds and hundreds of people that pray on that prayer chain. And so let me encourage you to take advantage of that when you need prayer. Um, but also anytime, like online or something, on social media, we'll put out, how can we pray for you? This one is always at the top of the list as a category Today we're talking about healing, of God moving into areas of our life, whether it's physical or spiritual or emotional or mental or relational, whatever, in our brokenness, for God to move into that brokenness with his healing power. And so today we're going to, uh, we're going to talk about that. And the good news is, is that God is a lot more like Christy, my wife, than me in a number of ways. And one of those ways is that Christy is a fixer. She's a repairer. Um, when something breaks around our house, if it, I don't try to repair anything because I just make it worse. And, I'll, if it, and if it's something like an air conditioner or something like, you know, that you repair, I'll call somebody. But I'm pretty quick if it's something else that's not so expensive. If something breaks, it's just time to get a new one. That's my default. Just, that's what Amazon is for. God made it really easy with Amazon. All you got to do is push the thing, right? And so, but Christy's not that way. She's a fixer. She's a repairer. Uh, for example, a couple weeks ago, I was vacuuming. Did I get points for that? Yeah, okay. I, I was vacuuming, and the back wheel came off. Now, it wasn't just like where you screw it in or what. It was a plastic housing fell off, so there's no way to really put it back on, I thought. But my wife is a fixer. So she's like, oh, no, we could totally fix that. I'm like, let's just get a new. No, no, we can totally fix that because she's convinced that if she has, it's these three things, WD-40, duct tape, and super glue, she can fix any problem in the world. Global warming, whatever, right? She, poverty, she can fix it with duct tape, WD-40, super glue. So we super glued that on. We'll see how it works, right? Now, I, I'm actually glad that she's not a get a new one that she's more of a, hey, let's fix the one we have, because a couple of weeks ago I had a cold. And she didn't get a new one. You know, a new husband, which I appreciate. She did use duct tape and super glue, which was awkward, but, uh, but she didn't get a new one, right? So God is, even more than Christy, a repairer. He's a fixer. He doesn't just move on from us because we're broken. Uh, he, he's not repelled by our brokenness. In fact, because he is a healer, and he is a shepherd and he loves us. He actually is attracted to our weakness. He's attracted to our struggle. He's attracted to our brokenness. Our sin, we'll talk about this in a future week, our sin doesn't repel him because he loves us. He wants to move into those areas of life and bring forgiveness and healing and help, not shame and guilt and all that kind of thing. So God is a healer. And today we're going to talk about how that works. In our lives. Today is actually going to be a healing service. And if you're new to church, maybe, you know, somebody invited you or you decided to try Chase Oaks or something this weekend and you're at one of our physical locations, you might be freaking out right now thinking, oh, great. 
I came to this church and they're going to do a healing service. What's that going to be? And I'll just, I'll just put you at ease. Uh, we're, it's not going to be that crazy. And you're in complete control. There's not going to be any snakes. Uh, there's not going to be a... I'm not going to all of a sudden become like a televangelist and slick back my hair and tell you to give me a bunch of money so God will heal you. Uh, if you, you can give me a bunch of money if you want, but God's, that's not going to change what God's going to do. In fact, don't, I can't even accept it if you tried. So, uh, it, ethically, because God, it doesn't work that way. But we are going to see how it, how it does work. And it's actually really simple, but really significant. And today could be a really powerful day in your life and my life if we're open to God moving into areas of brokenness. And some of us right now are kind of like, okay, I mean, we all, all of us underneath the facade of our lives have things that are broken. Because we're broken people. But sometimes those things rise to the surface. To where right now you're just really feeling it. Maybe for you when you think about healing. And it, it's, it's a physical thing. That you or someone you love is sick or injured. Or going through a cancer thing or something like that. And you're like man I, I really need God to bring healing. Physically. It may be a, a relational thing for you. Where in your marriage or in another relationship or just in your relationships in general or family, there's just brokenness there and hurt. And that you would want God to come into that with his healing power and, and bring restoration. Maybe it's emotional or mental, uh, like anxiety or depression, something like that. Or maybe it's an addiction or a sin struggle and you just can't get over Maybe there's failure and you have so much shame and guilt. And it just seems like you're, you're in the mud of that and can't get past that. And would want God to come in and bring healing and help to get you from where you are to a more healthy place. Wherever you're coming from, that's what we're going to talk about today. Is how God wants to intersect our life with his healing power. And we're going to see how it works. In fact, today we're going to look at a passage uh, in the New Testament where Jesus looks at somebody and says, Do you want to be healed? And I want to picture, like, I, I want you to think of today like that. Like Jesus being here, because he is here, saying to you and me, do you want to be healed? Because if you do, as we're going to see in this passage, there, there's a step to take. And in the New Testament, we're also going to see Jesus' uh, brother, uh, James, who, I mean, grew up with Jesus and all that, became a church leader, wrote the book of James. And we're going to also look at, at what he says about healing and how it works, and then you're going to have the opportunity to take a step. So that's where we're going. And again, not going to get weird, but it's going to be significant if we open up our life to what God wants to do. So we're going to be in John 5 is where we're going to start, where Jesus has this conversation with that guy. And uh, it's in John 5, chapter 1 in the New Testament. It says, afterward, Jesus returned to Jerusalem for one of the Jewish holy days. Inside the city near the sheep gate, because there's, you know, a wall around Jerusalem, so this is one of the gates into the city, was the pool of Bethesda with five covered porches. So in Jerusalem were different pools, and one of those was the pool of Bethesda. It was actually divided in half, so there were two pools uh, with this big shaded portico. And this is one of the places that we know that, you know, if you want to go to Israel and walk where Jesus walked, it's one of those places that you can do that because they, about 40 years ago, found the pool of Bethesda, and they, archaeologists came in and, and recovered all that, and, and, and so you can, it's pretty much the way it was when Jesus was there, and so you can go and experience that. It's one of the places we go as a church when we go take people on Israel trips. In fact, a number of people have asked about, hey, when are we going to Israel? You know, we just did the Immerse series at the beginning of the year where I tape from Israel at all these different sites. So we've had an uptick of people saying, man, I really want to do that trip. It'd be amazing to, to be there where the Bible stuff happened, to have the context of that. And it really is an amazing opportunity. And if you want to go, you can go. And it'll be in October of 2023. So I uh, save the date, October 16 to 25, 2023. If you want more information, we don't, you can't register yet because we don't have all the, all the details. Um, but if you want to get on a list to say, man, I, I, I want to make sure that I get that information so I can sign up because it will be a limited number of people, uh, you can email jeffjones at chaseoaks.org. That's my email for things like this. For complaints, uh, you can email not going to read it at chaseoaks.org. Um, <laughs> I'm kidding. If you, if you, if you, you can complain if you want to. But Jeff Jones at chaseoaks.org. I really don't mind feedback. 
honestly. But, um, but anyway, it's one of the places you go, Pool of Bethesda, a cool place. Well, 2,000 years ago, it was a very unique place because it was where if you, wanted, if you were sick and you wanted healing, you went there. And as we'll see, there's some reasons for that. So it says crowds of sick people, like lots of sick people, blind, lame, or paralyzed, lay on the porches. One of the men lying there had been sick, and we find out later he's paralyzed, he's uh, uh, paralytic, for 38 years. So Jesus goes to this pool that all these sick people were there, crowds of sick people were there, and they were there for a reason, because what they thought uh, at the time is that this was a healing pool. That this was kind of this magic angel healing pool. That what would happen, every once in a while, the waters in the spring would be disturbed. And they would, we see this reflected later in the story, and the waters would kind of bubble up real quick and then go down real quick. And the rumor somehow spread that the reason it does that is there's an angel that comes every once in a while and stirs the water. And and not an angel you can see, an angel uh, that you couldn't see, would stir the water and if you were the first one in the pool, then you, you would be healed of whatever. So all these people were there trying to be the first person in the magic angel healing pool. And so Jesus goes to the magic pool. It really wasn't a magic pool, but he goes to the pool with all these people. And for whatever reason, he zeroes in on this one guy who's been paralyzed for 38 years, which in 2,000 years ago, there was no social safety net. It was... Now, he, was just a, he, he would be a beggar, he'd be destitute, it'd be terrible to be in that situation. And he goes right up to him, and here's where we have that question that I mentioned earlier, verse 6. When Jesus saw him and knew that he had been ill for a long time, he asked him, would you like to get well? Now, when you think about that, you think, well, why does Jesus have to ask that? I mean, he's at the magic angel healing pool. So you think, well, isn't it kind of obvious that he wants to get well? So why does Jesus not just heal him? Why does he say, do you want to get well? Well, why? And, and we don't know fully. We have some clues in the passage uh, that we'll talk about. But I certainly think part of it is, is that God will do a whole lot in our lives when we open up our lives to him. Do you want to get well? And you think, well, who wouldn't want to get well? Who wouldn't open up their lives to God's transforming healing power? Most people. I mean, Jesus is alive. He wants to come into your life and mine with his healing power. But most people are like, hey, I'm I'm okay. I'm really not. But most people don't open up their life to him. We'll talk about, you know, some of the reasons why. But a lot of people, a lot of us have areas in our life. All of us really have areas in our life where we just prefer to stay broken. Rather than open up that part of life to his healing power. But in this case, I think this guy did want to be healed. And we're going to see that. But his problem was a false hope. That what he was looking to for healing would never bring healing. And we see that reflected when he responds, do you want to be healed? Here's how he responds. Verse 7. I can't, sir, I can't be healed, the sick man said. For I have no one to put me into the pool when the water bubbles up. Someone always gets there ahead of me because he's paralyzed. He can't get there himself. So somebody else always gets there first. And he's like, see, I'll never be healed. I can't because his hope was in this magic pool. But what Jesus knew is it wasn't a magic pool. And there was no angel stirring it. And it's not like God was obligated to heal you if you got in the water. for like That wasn't even a thing. But for a lot of people, that was their hope. It was just a false hope. Because what actually happened in that pool is it was spring fed. And Jerusalem is very hilly. It's a mountainous area. And the, where the spring is is above where the pool is. And so occasionally in, in the underground stream that filled this spring, that, this spring that filled this pool, these cisterns, these natural cisterns were around and they would fill up overflow you'd have this extra injection of water temporarily it would make the water go and then you know go up and then go down that's what was happening there was no angel stirring the water and jesus knew that and so i think part of what jesus was saying when he said do you want to get well is like looking at him i I think you could kind of hear it like this like do you want to get well because it's not going to happen here 
And it's not going to happen with some major, you know, angelic magic pool thing. Like that, it's not going to happen. You can stay here forever, 38 more years, and it's never going to happen. Now, you and I can look back 2,000 years later and think, oh, those people 2,000 years ago were so gullible. I mean, they, they look to things like, you know, this angel story and, and this pool thing and what a goober and, you know, these poor people. They were just, they weren't very smart 2,000 years ago because they had all these false hopes. But guess what? 2,000 years later, I have false hopes and you do too. Things that we look to for life, for meaning, for healing, for wholeness that don't actually help at all. But we lean on them. All of us do that. It's part of our sin nature. It, it, what, the way one guy describes it, Henry Cloud, is he talks about pseudo-connection, that we all look to things other than God for connection and meaning that we think is gonna, that are going to bring it. And these are things that may give us a little bit of a short-term lift. They may make us feel better in the short run, but they don't actually make us better in the long run. There are things that we look to for life that maybe gives a little bit of, oh, but not real life. In fact, often it goes the other way. I mean, sometimes it's things like, I don't know if you've ever come home from a bad day or a hard day and be like, oh, I, gotta have, I need a margarita or I need a drink or whatever. And there's nothing wrong with margaritas and there's nothing wrong with drinks. The Bible says don't get drunk. But drinking is, I mean, Jesus drank, so, you know, you don't have to drink. It's not like you have to. But there's no problem with it is all I'm saying if, if in, the, in the right context and all that. But the wrong context is that. Is, oh, I've got to have a drink. I can't go without a drink. That's that's. You're on your way to a problem, right? Because that one drink becomes another one and another one and another one. And it's an example. It may make you feel a little bit better in the short run, but it's not going to make life better in the long run. Any, any substances, you know, you insert in the, case, in, 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 in the blank. Or sinful things. You know, watching, uh, you know, going to a porn thing or, you know, going in, in a party mode and sleeping around or messing around or whatever and think it gives a little bit of life. It gives a little bit of lift, but it actually takes you backwards, not forwards. But it's not just bad things or sinful things. It's also it could be good things or neutral things that we look to for life, for healing. That, that makes us just feel a little bit better, but doesn't actually make us better. So maybe you spend more time with a hobby like for me in golf. It doesn't make you better. <laughs> At least that, I've spent a lot of time trying to get better, and I don't get better in golf or in life. I mean, golf's fine. There's no problem with it. But if I use it for the wrong thing, right, it's just going to be disappointing. Or more time in my career or more time with, you know, another relationship or, or surrounding myself with people who just tell me I'm great but who don't speak truth into my life. Well, there's all kinds of things that can, that can make us feel good that don't make us better in the long run. And Jesus is just saying, hey, you know, it's, it's not going to happen in a magic pool or whatever we use. And so and he says, so do you, do you really want to get better? And evidently the guy did want to get better because Jesus gives him that opportunity. Because the good news for this guy is hope, real hope, not false hope. Real hope is standing right in front of him. Because the, the only real hope is Jesus for what is broken in our life. And the good news is he is... Everywhere. He is right in front of us. He's right here right now. He is always ready to come into our life with his healing power. And he, in this case, he's standing right in front of the guy at the pool. And so he says, verse 8, Jesus told him, if you want to get well, here's what you're going to do. Jesus said to him, stand up, pick up your mat and walk. And he does. Instantly, the man was healed. He rolled up his sleeping mat and began walking. Now think about what Jesus did here. Because, yeah, he healed him, but notice he doesn't just say, hey, okay, you know what? I just healed you. Poof, you're healed. Now, why don't you try to stand up? I'll even help you. It's not what he says. He gives him a command. Stand up. Get your mat. Quit lying around. And walk. He, gives him a, he commands him to do something that he can't do. He's paralyzed. I mean, if he could have done that, he would have done that every day for the last 38 years, but he couldn't do that. But Jesus is saying, that's what I want. I want you to stand up and walk. 
Now, Jesus says when he tries to stand up, he's going to empower him to do that. He's going to heal him. But he had to take that first step. He had to make the decision, okay, I'm going to try this. I'm going to take a step. I'm going to stand up, get my mat, and walk, which is a series of steps. I'm going to walk into the future that he has for me. And I think that's really important to understand. Because most of the time, to get us from where we are in our brokenness, to get to where we want to be and God wants us to be, it's not just passive that we just say, okay, God, heal me. I'm not going to do anything. Just heal me. But God will typically ask us to take a step and another step and another step toward wholeness and toward healing in areas of our life. And a lot of people, as we said, just tend to just don't. They just stay in their brokenness. Whereas Jesus would say, hey, you know what? In your brokenness, stand up. Get up and walk. You don't have to just stay in your brokenness. You don't have to be a victim. You don't have to... You can actually choose to step into the life of healing that God wants for you. And that's true for all of us. And, all, all, and, I, and I thought about this this week. And I was hoping I wouldn't be able to come up with an answer. But it was so easy in praying for this where God just... I, and my question for God was, is there an area in my life that's broken? A relationship, a, something in my own life or something like that's broken, and I'm just choosing to keep it broken, unwilling to take a step that I know I could take toward healing, and that you would meet me in that step, and you would empower it, and it would move toward, have every potential to move toward healing. And it, it took that long, God, to say, uh, yeah. And there's an area, I mean, it, just, it was almost embarrassing. It's just like, okay, God, you're right. I'm just let, letting that stay broken when I know the step to take. And I'm just not taking it because it's easier not to. It's a little unpredictable what will happen, and it's just a relational thing. And so what, it's just easy. It, but God would say, no, take, get up. Take the step of obedience. Take the step of faith, and I'll meet you there. So for some of you, it may be, like in my case, a relational thing. Uh, mine isn't so much about hurt, but maybe yours is. Like maybe you've been hurt really deeply and you're bitter and you're angry and it affects every, not just that relationship but other relationships. And sometimes it's easier just to stay bitter where Jesus would say, no, take a step of obedience, take a step of faith, take a step called forgiveness. And you don't have to wallow in all that, in bitterness and anger. You can actually forgive and move forward. That's up to you. God will help you do it. Or, you know, maybe you think, man, I'm just so lonely and I'm so disconnected. And, and that's terrible. There's, I mean, that's happening all over the place. There's a loneliness epidemic in our culture. But there's steps we can take toward community, toward connection, toward serving in, alongside people and all that. I mean, there, there's steps you can take. Maybe there's brokenness in, in your marriage relationship or in some other, you know, family dynamic. And you think, well, yeah, it's just broken. Well, there's steps you can take. You can't control the other person, but you can, you can take steps for you in that relationship. You can suggest, hey, we, I think we need to talk to somebody. I think we need to, you know, or I, I was so proud of somebody this week at Chase Oker that is, is dealing with depression and know, knew that I have dealt with depression in the past and who just said, hey, I, I don't want to be just ashamed of this. I, I don't want to hide from this. I want, to, I want to, he took a step to talk to me, to say, I know you've dealt with it. What can I do? Because I really don't want to stay like this. Well, it'd be a whole lot easier not to come and talk to me about that. But he was smart enough, wise enough to say, I'm going to take a step. Right? Same thing with physical healing. Mental, emotional, what, there's steps that we can take, and we're going to see what one of those steps is. In fact, today we're going to see from the New Testament, another part of the New Testament, a step all of us can take. There may be three or four other steps that we can say, oh, yeah, I need to do that, I need to do that. But all of us can do the step that we're going to do today. And you'll have the opportunity, whatever campus you're at, to do today to take this step. And it's in James 5. And it's how healing works. Because you think, well, how would healing work now? Like, if I want healing in some way, I guess I could go sit by a pool and hope that Jesus shows up. Right? So I could, if, if I don't have a pool, I'll go to my neighbor's pool or I'll go to the neighborhood pool and just lay there, hoping that Jesus will walk up and say, hey, you want to be healed? 
But that's a bad strategy. It's a bad plan because Jesus is in heaven physically. One day he'll return, but he won't return for that. So in the meantime, what do we do? Well, it's better because, uh, because Jesus had made an, a provision for you and me, anybody who wants it, to be healed. It is, it is up to you and me to take a step. Nobody else. It's up to you and me to take this step. And in the New Testament, we're told this is the healing ministry in the New Testament. Jesus is in heaven. In the meantime, how does healing work now? How does he heal? And he just tells us. And it, it's, his, it's his brother, James. You know, Jesus had brothers and, um, that he grew up with. One of those brothers was James. A friend of mine in Houston is doing a series, sermon series on the book of James right now called What Did That Brother Say? Which I think is awesome. I mean, I, I think that's such a great, I, I wish I had used that when I taught on James. What did that brother say? But anyway, this is one of those things that that brother said in James 5. And it is so straightforward. You think, well, how does healing work today? Here it is. And by the way, it's not, there's no snakes. There's no dippity do hair. There's no give me a bunch of money. There's no, it's not crazy. But it's really clear. James 5, 14. Are any of you sick? Okay, here's what you should do. You should call for the elders of the church to come and pray over you, anointing you with oil in the name of the Lord. Such a prayer offered in faith will heal the sick and the Lord will make you well. That's not ambiguous. It's not like, well, how does healing work today? I don't think, I don't understand. It tells you, if you're sick, it's on you to take a step. Call the elders of the church to come and pray over you. And God will heal heal that. God will hear that and he'll respond. And we take that really seriously around here. That is our approach to healing as a church because of this passage. And one of the things, we have these people in our church called elders. I know it sounds scary if you're new to church, elders, you know. But elder is simply like, it's it's the primary leaders of the church. Uh, we're led not just by me. We're led by a team of people, and it's called, they're called elders uh, from this New Te- uh, the New Testament wording. And elders are like the board of directors with a lot of spiritual responsibility on top of it, like this one. And our elders pray for the sick. And any time that you need prayer and you want healing prayer, you can call the church and say, I would like uh, to meet with the elders and have them pray over me. And that's one of the things we do. Today, at all of our campuses, we have the opportunity to do that because we have elders and pastors and other leaders who are going to be at all of our campuses in a little bit. You'll have the opportunity, if you want, to come forward uh, while we do a song and whatever's going on in your life that you want healing and you want uh, wholeness, that, to pray. Now, it does raise a question, though, because you think, well, wait a minute. It says if you, like, you're sick, these guys will pray for you and then you'll be well then what happens, like, let's, so like I have a broken leg, I go and I talk to these people, they pray over me, and all of a sudden, poof, I don't need a cast anymore. Is that the way it works? It's a great question, right? And the answer is, God will answer and he will heal, but how that works is not always the way we think of it. And then yet it can be confusing. Like I've told this story, I don't have time to do it now, but I've told the story in my life how when I was 12, um, I believe I was healed from leukemia. I was in the hospital for a week. Uh, they did a bunch of tests. I had every symptom of leukemia. All the tests came back positive. My granddad, who was a pastor and a real person of prayer, uh, prayed. And on Friday was the bone marrow test. And before the bone marrow test, he called my mom at 2 or 3 in the morning and said, Honey, I prayed through was his comment, was his way of thinking about prayers, that he would pray until he believed God had answered. And, and, uh, and he believed God answered. He said, Honey, he's... He, God's healed him, and it's going to be negative. And when they run all those other tests, they're going to be, he, he does, I mean, can you imagine the boldness of that? And, uh, but he did. I told you I didn't have time to tell the story. Here we go. And, uh, and um, but he, he did. And so in the next day, they did the test, and guess what? It was negative. And they went back and ran every other test that had all been positive all week. They were all negative. And the doctors were like, hey, we don't have an explanation for that medically. And one of the doctors was a believer, Christian, and just said, yeah, this is not about medicine. This one's about God. And he didn't have leukemia. He did. I'm convinced of that. 
but he does it now. Well, that's a cool story, right? That's kind of, hey, write a book, go on tour, do a podcast, right? Those are the ones that we're like, ah, that's awesome. But my dad had ALS five, six years ago. I prayed for healing and he died of ALS. My brother, a year and a half ago, had cancer that went to his brain, went into a coma. In that coma, he was in the coma for months, praying that God would bring, that God would take him out of that and heal the cancer. God did not. So what is it? Like, what does that even mean? Well, there's different ways God answers those prayers for healing. I believe he always answers. A a professor of mine at Dallas Seminary, where I went to grad school, uh, I think summarizes so well what the Bible says about this. That there are three ways God answers prayer for healing. The first one is called intervention. The second one, interaction. The third one, intervention. But here's the first one, intervention. That's where, like my story, where God just whammies you. You were sick. You're not sick anymore. And just in a miraculous way, boom, it happens. And again, that's always cool and that happens. And one of the ways I pray, I have a friend right now, one of our pastor's wife, Susie, who's in a, in a significant cancer journey, in a big time of treatment right now, and I'm praying that God will do that. They'll just whammy, and she'll be healed. That'd be great. I'd sign up for it. That's interaction. Another, I mean, that's uh, intervention. Another one is, the other one, it's interaction. Interaction is where God interacts with us in a process of healing, meaning an emotional, mental thing. We pursue, you know, we, we work with a therapist, we, uh, in, in, like with Susie, she's doing the stem cell transplant. She's going into ke- uh, severe, you know, a lot of chemotherapy and all this kind of stuff. And, and I'm praying, in addition, that God will just heal her. I'm also praying for interact, that God will interact with that medical care, will superintend it in such a way that he'll give wisdom to those doctors. He'll give wisdom to all those people who are involved, that the therapy would be effective, that it would work. That's interaction. And the other one is intervention, I-N-N-E-R, intervention. That God doesn't necessarily change our circumstance because we live in a broken world where we're going to suffer and be sick one day. That won't happen anymore. That's called heaven. But now that will. And God doesn't always just heal because otherwise we'd have 2,000-year-old Christians running around, you know, because every time something happens, you never die because you get healed. It doesn't work that way, right? But intervention is another way God does that. And it answers prayer for healing. It's actually the most profound. Intervention is where he doesn't change our circumstance, but he changes us in the circumstance. And, and it's actually the, the best gift. It doesn't always feel like it, but Paul talks about that in 2 Corinthians 12. He said, three times I pleaded with the Lord to take it away from me. Now, this is Paul. So if anybody's prayer is going to be effective, I mean, this guy who wrote a lot of the New Testament, he's a godly guy. But God said to me, so there's some physical malady he had. We don't know what it is. God said, and he said three times, God, take it away. I want healing. Pray for it. You know, I, I want you to take this away from me. But he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you. For my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, I, therefore Paul says, meaning God said, no, I'm not going to heal you. I'm going to give you strength. I'm going to give you grace to deal with it. Paul says, therefore, I will boast all the more gladly about my weaknesses so that Christ's power may rest on me. For when I am weak, then I am strong. He says he he glories in difficulty, he glories in persecution, he glories in all this stuff. Because when he's weak, that's where God is strong in his life. And the guy that I talked to that talked to me the other day about depression. I, I, I passed on to him what a mentor had passed on to me years ago when she said, Jeff, God is honoring you with this struggle. Most people, he just allows to stay shallow. He does. Some people, he blesses with a deep struggle. He said, Jeff, the, the point of this is not to get undepressed, even though that would be great. The point of this is to find God in the middle of the depression. And you'll meet him, and he'll meet you in a way that you'll be forever changed. And I wouldn't trade that time in my own life for anything. And even I look, as I look at what he did with my, in my dad's case, in my brother's case, there was a lot of intervention that happened. I wouldn't trade it for a thing. So God is a healer. 
And he wants to move into our life with, in, in ways that are broken. And we're going to pray, and you're going to have the opportunity to do that. And I'm going to just challenge you to get up. It, when it's a prayer, just a little bit, we're going to do a song after I pray to get up. If you have a mat, you can bring it. Like he said, get up, take up your mat and walk. But just get up and come for prayer. And just the way the New Testament says. It, it's kind of like Jesus looking at you coming into this room and saying, do you want to be healed? And I don't know where you need healing, but I know all of us have brokenness in our life. So for you, it may be a physical thing that you're dealing with right now. And you're like, I, I really need God's healing power. And I invite you to, in a little bit, get up and come. We're going to, in, in this room, we'll be right over here in this area, uh, over that direction. And there'll be people to pray with you. It might be emotional or a, a mental illness challenge like my depression or anxiety or something else. Um, it might be a sin issue. Um, in James 5, in the same context, it says confess your sins so that you can be for Sometimes it's just sins that are besetting sins that we just can't. It's like I, I'm not winning here. Like I, I, I'm stuck. Or maybe you're stuck in guilt or shame. God doesn't want us stuck in guilt or shame. And he's like, I, I want release from that. I want God to pull me out of that. Maybe it is a relational thing in a marriage or a friendship or a relationship or just something that's really broken. And you're like, God, I need a breakthrough. I, I, I want you to move into that and bring health and healing. Maybe it's a failure that you've had and, and, you, just, and you just can't get over it. You just feel like a failure and God doesn't want you to feel like So, God, I, I need healing. I, I don't know what it is, but I know all of us in our life have brokenness and God can bring healing. And I know it's easier not to come up. It's easier just to stay as we are. You can picture that guy just saying, no, I'm not going to try to get up. I've tried that already for 38 years. I'm not going to do that. But he got up and he took up his mat. And he walked. And, and sometimes when you do that, you think, wait a minute, if I get up or we get up as a couple, people are going to think we have problems. Guess what? They know you have problems. Because we all have problems. That's all we are. I mean, if you're new to our church, I, I, wanna, I hate to break it to you, but there's no perfect people here. And, and, and if you're perfect, it's going to be hard to fit in. But if you're imperfect, it's a great place to be. Because what we celebrate is a bunch of imperfect people who authentically just open up our lives to God who loves imperfection and wants to bring healing and wholeness. And, and that's what we do. That, that's what we celebrate around here. We're not here to impress each other. We're just here to love each other on that journey uh, as broken people to wholeness. And so what's going to happen is I'm going um, to pray here in a minute. In fact, I'll go ahead and ask the, those people that I talked about, those elders and leaders, to get up out of your chair now before I pray here in the Legacy Auditorium and go over to that area. So... Please do that. Um, after I pray, you'll be released at the campuses to your campus pastor. If you're online and wonder, hey, what do I do? Uh, you can come to a campus on Sunday if you're in the area, but you can also um, just reach out. to. Uh, you can use that same email address, jeffjones at jsoaks.org, and somebody this week will contact you and pray with you. Um, but in the room, it's an opportunity. We're going to sing a song here after I pray, and during that song, just to get up and come for prayer. So let's, let's bow our heads together. Father, I thank you that you are a healer. That you're not repulsed by our brokenness. Uh, you're attracted to it. Because you want to help. You want to bring healing. You want to move into those areas of our life that need repair and restoration. And so, Father, I pray for all of us in this room that you would move into our life with your healing power. And, and you say, if anybody needs healing, anybody needs restoration, call the elders of the church to pray so they can lay their hands on you and I'll answer. And so Father, I pray that you'd help just a whole lot of people to speak into their heart and life to say, that's a step I want you to take right now. And whatever other step that you're laying on our hearts right now, Father, give us the wisdom and the boldness to do that too. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.